Okay, good evening everyone. Tonight we are returning to the study of the Dhammapada. Today verses 183, 184, and 185. Three verses that go together. And they go as follows. Sabapa akaranam Kusalasa upasampada Sachitta pariyodapanang etang buddha nasasana That's 183. It means not doing all evil uh, bringing goodness to fulfillment doing good things together with purifying the mind This is the teaching of all Buddhas. One eighty four Kanti Paramang Tapo Titika Nibanang Paramang Vadanti Buddha Nahipa Pachito Parupaghati Samano Hoti Parang Vihetayanto. Patience is the highest form of austerity. Patience or forbearance. The Buddhas say Nibbana is the highest. Nibbana is the highest, say the Buddhas. One is not a one cannot be called one who has truly gone forth if they should strike another, harm another. One is not called a shaman or a samana, a recluse, if one harms another. One eighty five Anupavado Anupaghato Pati Moke Jasangvaro Matanyuta Jabatasming Pantancha Sayana Sanang Adhijite Jayogo Etang Buddhana Sasana Not scolding, not harming. Restrained in the rules, the code of conduct of the community. Moderation in food, a secluded dwelling. and devotion to higher states of mind. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. So, these three verses, it should be maybe evident if you haven't heard them before, that they're somewhat important, central to Buddhism. They may be the most famous of the verses in the Dhammapada. In, in Buddhist circles, so, or if you haven't heard them. The first one, I think, perhaps is the most important. It's one of the most important verses in Buddhism, simply because it sums up Buddhism quite well. I mean, simplistically, but, but very simply. So the story behind these verses, the story that's given in the Dhammapada is quite short. It's not much of a story at all. Ananda is in meditation. You'll find that a lot of the later stories in the Dhammapada get short, quite short. But this one is a bit of a non-story. Ananda thinks to himself, well, the Buddha has told us all about the other Buddhas and 
how how Buddhas are different from each other, how they are the same, how remarkable it is, how how similar they are. But I wonder how it is in regards to keeping the holidays, the holy days. So in, in before the Buddha's time, there was a recognized spiritual importance, which is artificial, I think, but uh, related to the moon. Right? Of course, what's spiritual about the moon? Well, psychologically, there seems to be a connection. Apparently, the full moon is when lots of uh, crimes are committed. There's, there's statistics to back it up. Maybe even physically there's a connection, something about the gravity or something, I don't know. Certainly it affects the tides. It may very well affect humans. But the tradition in India was that on the on the empty moon, the new moon, when there's when you can't see a moon in the sky because it's on the wrong side of the earth. And and the full moon when it's, I don't know, on the right side of the earth, between, no, I don't know, anyway, the full moon, however it, it works. So on the full moon and the new moon, there were holy, holy days. And in Buddhism as well, there's this, this adoption of this tradition, but of course, a different sort of practice. And so Ananda wondered, how is it, was it different among Buddhas? And he went to see the Buddha, and the Buddha said to him, No, they all kept the holiday the same. They kept the holiday by convening all the monks together. All the monks would get together, and the Buddha would recite these verses. So, it's kind of like us getting together tonight. You, you go off and practice, and every couple of days you come to, we come together, and you get a pep talk. You get a, some kind of teaching, something to give you food for thought, encouragement, uh, direction, clarity, that sort of thing. And so in the time of the Buddha and in time of all Buddhas, this would, this was the way it was. They wouldn't constantly receive teaching. Many monks would go off in the forest for many days, but they knew that on the full moon and the new moon they should get together and receive instructions. And some of the instructions are going to be about communal harmony, and that's what you see in these verses. But the Buddha said that this, this was the teaching that all Buddhas give, so I can't verify that, of course, and I can't verify that the Buddha actually said that that was the case, or even that Ananda was thinking such a thing, but, well, that's the story. There's another story associated with these verses because the thing is these verses were what the Buddha taught from the very first Buddhist holiday when the Buddha got all the monks together. Apparently the first time it happened was 10 months after the Buddha had become enlightened and he was in Veluwana, I think, in Rajagaha first Buddhist monastery, so he had been given a monastery. He went back to Rajagaha after teaching the five ascetics. And on his way back to Rajagaha, he met this man Yasa, a rich young man, and there's a story about him. I think we even have verses about him. And converted him and his, I think, 64 friends. So that's 65 more. No way. 59 friends, maybe. I can't remember the numbers. I think it was 60 altogether. And then you've got the other five. First five is 65, I think. Maybe it was 55 plus five is 60. It actually was probably that, 60. I think in the end there were 60 monks and the Buddha said to them, go spread the Dhamma. And no, this wasn't on the way. See, my memory is terrible. This was before he left. So Yasa came to him and all these 60 monks, at the end of the rains, the Buddha sent them all, all 60 of them, to become, uh, to, to spread the Buddha's teaching. 
anyway. Don't quote me on the numbers. But then he went back to Rajagaha. And on the way, before stopping in Rajagaha, he went up on the mountains outside of Rajagaha where these ascetics were living and he converted all of them. There was a thousand of them. And then he went to meet King Bimbisara and because he had the support of all these many ascetics, Bimbisara and all the all of the uh, people of Rajagaha were quite impressed by him and the fact that he had converted so many other ascetics to become Buddhist. So they were also all converted. And Rajaga became a very important Buddhist sort of base. I mean, it became a stronghold of Buddhism. The first monastery was Weiluana, which is the bam Weilu means bamboo. And the Buddha spent some time there, but uh, while he was there, in the full moon of Magha, which we call now Magha Punami, and in Thailand they actually celebrate it as a holiday, and they talk about this meeting. The Buddha was sitting, sitting alone, and I think the story goes that all these monks had not yet become arahants. Right, that's the point. So, the 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 other monks had become arahants. The three disciples, these three ascetics, had become arahants. But here we had a thousand monks, somewhere two thousand two hundred and fifty more, and they all became arahant on this night. This is how the story goes. It's just a story. The Buddha was sitting under the open air, under the full moon. And suddenly, well, then a monk, along comes a monk coming to see the Buddha to tell him that he's become an arahant. And he sits down in front of the Buddha, pays his respect, and he's going to tell the Buddha that he's practiced successfully and become an arahant. But before he does, he thinks to himself, well, I'll make sure that we're alone. And he turns, and he sees another monk coming. So he waits. The other monk comes, sits down, pays respect turns, and, oh, and another monk's coming. Third one comes, fourth, and then this happens consistently. I don't know, did it actually happen that way? This is the story. Until there were 1,250 arahants gathered together. So it's called the Chaturanga Sanipata, which means the fourfold meeting, the four the meeting that has four qualities. The first is that they all came together, they were 1,250 of them, without being called. Second is they were all arahants. The third is they'd all been ordained by the Buddha. And the fourth is the Buddha taught the Ovada Patimokkha. So he was sitting there and he taught these verses as the, the first admonition to the Sangha, a regular admonition to remind them to be in communal harmony and following the Buddha's teaching. That's, I think, the proper story for these verses, how they came about. It's a very important meeting in Buddhist history. As to the importance of these verses for Buddhists and for us, our practice as meditators in, Buddha, in the Buddhist tradition, um, I mean, part of it is very important. Part of it, I think, is just something that reminds us of how to live in a community, but we'll go through it piece by piece. The first verse, as I said, is, is the most important and the most influential, giving a very good summary of Buddhism that you can take with you if anyone asks, wants well, a simple, question, simple answer to the question, what is Buddhism? What, do Buddhists, what did the Buddha teach? Or what is Buddhism from our perspective? And it's three things. Don't do evil deeds. Do good deeds and purify the mind. Which, on the face, I think it's easy to dismiss and think of as quite simplistic and quite similar to other religions. It's very easy to miss the third part. Miss the significance of the third part. 
because the first two are indeed quite um, similar and, and, and you know, widespread. It's the kind of thing you hear in any religious, spiritual, moral, ethical, cultural tradition. Do good, don't do evil. But there's two problems with that, of course, which the third one, I think, addresses. The first is, how do you know what's good and what's evil? Some religious traditions get it quite wrong, saying killing is good. Many will say that alcohol or even drugs are good. And even if they get the basics right, like no killing or stealing, those are all evil things. There's still, it's still very rare to see a good understanding of, of actual evil. Why is it evil to kill? Well, killing isn't itself evil. If you step on an ant, didn't know the ant was there, did you commit evil? When you say you did, well, you have to give us a reason why you think that is evil. Evil in, in Buddhism, of course, is, is in the mind. It has nothing to do with the killing. It has to do with the mental qualities required to rob another being of its life, to suppress your own uh, inclination towards life and towards the preservation of your own life and life in general, to be cruel and to deny that to another being. I mean, there's a psychological process that goes on. That's what we say is evil. But you can't see that if you don't do something else. You can't simply start from telling people not to do evil if they don't know and, and don't have a clear understanding of what is evil. I mean, it's not enough, at least. You can convince people of it temporarily, but in the long term it's not sustainable. It, it, it leads to a lot of doubt and uncertainty and, and discomfort, having to follow rules that you don't really understand or you find yourself having to put blind faith into, which is very difficult to sustain. The second problem is, even if you know what is evil, and, and of course what is good, right? If you know that meditation is good, or you know, you know that um, charity is good, that love is good, that wisdom is good. Putting aside meditation for a second, right? Because that's the third one. We just know that this quality is good and that quality is good. And we know that this quality is bad, this, that quality is bad, greed is bad, anger is bad, delusion is bad. How do we get rid of them? It's not enough to know what is, what is bad and try your best not to do it. I'll say, okay, I know anger is bad, I'll try my best not to be angry. Without purifying your mind, doing evil and or not doing evil and doing good is much easier to say than to actually accomplish. And so this is considered to be the what distinguishes Buddhism from most other traditions, was the purification of the mind. Not even just the tranquilizing of the mind, the tranquility or peace that comes from certain meditation traditions, but actually cultivating in the mind the capacity, the clarity, the purity that allows us to see what is good and what is evil. And not just see intellectually, but to feel, to appreciate, to know, really know for yourself without doubt, without speculation, without even extrapolation that this is bad and that is good. What is good, what is bad? Because that, that is, that knowledge, that understanding, seeing, is what truly allows us to stop doing evil and to, it, it kind of forces you. You can never do evil if you knew it was bad. So just saying, I know it's wrong to do this or do that. If you knew, you wouldn't do it. There's a deeper knowing, a knowing that is based on seeing, based on 
on experiencing. It's like when you get angry in meditation, you feel it. You say, well, that's bad, and then you feel it again, you get angry again, you feel it again. So in the beginning, you don't, you're, you're, you're banging your head against the wall because you don't really get it. If you see it enough, if you observe that enough, you'll notice that, oh, it will actually go away and I'll be less in, I'm less inclined to be angry. This is because of seeing, this is because of the purity. So if you want, to, if anyone asks, what is Buddhism? This is a very easy way to explain to them what is Buddhism. I think another thing that it does, and this whole, all three of these verses do, is they show what Buddhism is not. It's not a lot of extraneous, superfluous baggage, right? If that's all, if those three are what all Buddhists teach, then all you you you've cut off any sort of view, any sort of intellectualization, any I mean any sort of belief, right? Any sort of dogma. You don't have to believe that these 1,250 monks got together. That's not what Buddhists teach. Well, these are stories we tell. Were they true? I'm not inclined to to argue with them. I don't. I, mean, I don't see the point, because even if they were not true, it wouldn't change what the Buddhists taught. It wouldn't change Buddhism. So that's the first verse. Very good. One to remember, sabapapasa akaranang kusala supasampada. Kusala supasampada. Sachita pariyoda panangi tan buddha anasasana. Three things are the Buddha's teaching. The second verse, three parts. The first is that patience. And remember, this is a, this is mostly focused on people living as you're living here temporarily, living in a monastic community. Because you're all, most of you here for a short time, you won't probably experience a lot of the problems of living in a spiritual community, the challenges. It's quite easy, much easier to do this temporarily than to have to live in a monastic community long term and maintain the sort of harmony that you experience short term. But there, it's useful to think of, and it's useful to look at the words that the Buddha used. The first one's very useful, and it's useful outside of monasticism as well, uh, in, specifically in meditation practice. And without even talking about living in a, in a meditation community, when we practice at home, and you're living your life, patience. Uh, even outside of the practice, it's very important, right? But the words the Buddha used are, are interesting to look at. Tapas, he said. Kanti paramang tapo. So tapo is from tapas. Tapas, if you, for those people who have learned anything about Indian religion or spirituality, tapas, tapas literally means heat. It's probably where the word temperature comes from. Or tepid, maybe. And so, as with many Sanskrit words, it became adopted in a spiritual sense. And the theory went like this. We know that clinging and desire and lust is a real problem. Just as today we talk about how materialism, consumerism is a problem, our greed for material things, we're destroying the earth, how it tears people apart, it leads to theft, it leads to manipulation, it leads to jealousy, it leads to addiction. So this is the kind of thing that led people to spirituality. In India this was a, a movement. There was this movement to leave home and find some way to free yourself from these bad things and from the karma that comes from them. Bad karma. So people, of course, had many ideas of what was bad karma, but you would go off into the forest 
And the idea is you would do something the opposite. You would generally torture yourself. So tapas came to me in torture. Why? Why torture? Because torture you would if you if you really put yourself through great pain. The idea is you would burn up all your lust, all your desire would go away. Because it's the opposite. Instead of having lots of pleasure, of course it's ridiculous. In Buddhism we don't have this belief, but if you put a lot of pain then somehow uh, it would retrain the mind to be used to pain and not need pleasure. To some extent, I think it probably works. I mean, on a very superficial level. I think here you have to go through a lot of pain from having to sleep on the floor to having to sit on the floor to having to eat only in the morning. It can be a bit painful sometimes. Even just having to walk very slowly can be a bit painful. Putting up with pain isn't a bad thing. But there's nothing special about it. If that's your goal, if that's your spiritual practice, on a superficial level it makes you a bit stronger, I think. Certainly these ascetics in India were quite impressive. Their ability to withstand pain. You, know, you guys complain about pain. The pain that these ascetics had to go through, standing on one leg or lying on a bed of nails. I don't know, all sorts of crazy things they did. So in, it's within that context that the Buddha says this. He says, what is the highest form of torture? That's what the word came to mean. Austerity is maybe more literal. The highest form of torture, let's put it that way, because I think it's a good, th good way to phrase it, is patience. So when I tease you about being, not being able to bear pain, I guarantee if, you, if I were to tell you to to hurt yourselves, you would have a very much easier time of doing that than, than uh, bearing with pain or ple and pleasure. Patience is the hardest, I think you can argue, is the hardest form of torture, but also the highest form of torture. It's actually noble because it's torture. It's torture to have to sit through things you don't like without reacting, right? It's also torture to sit through things you do like without reacting, without grasping after them. But no, more literally, tapas is again heat, so it's the highest form of burning up of defilements to be patient. So in the beginning, this has the has the appearance of struggle. It's a, a struggle to change your habits of behavior, your patterns of reaction. When you experience something pleasant, the struggle to not cling to it, to not like it, to not expect for it to be there, or want for it to be there. We experience something unpleasant, the struggle not to react, not to run away from it, but also not to get upset about it, not to want to change it. But true patience, that which truly removes the defilements, is the higher form. Once you've practiced and become accomplished, it's really the noblest form of spiritual practice, which is again another description of what tapas means. The greatest spiritual practice is when you can experience all the whole spectrum of reality without judgment, without clinging. It's true peace, it's true happiness, it's the, the highest form of living in samsara, the highest form of experience. Because it's peaceful, it's happy, it's content. There's no wanting, there's nothing wanting, there's nothing lacking. And so you think, you think of that, it directly relates to what we 
are practicing when we cultivate mindfulness, what we're aiming for, what we're training ourselves in. Not any kind of artificial uh, state, just a clarity of mind that allows us to see things as they are. Seeing is seeing, hearing is hearing, thinking is thinking, pain is pain. You train yourself enough in this, you, you gain this true form of patience. It's called anulomika kanti, patience which goes with the grain, with the truth, in line with the truth. It's not patience where you're um, gritting your teeth and bearing it. Or you're just struggling. It's true patience. When we talk about a person being very patient, a person who is very patient has no reaction to good things or bad things. They don't get upset or uh, at attached to anything. Their peace and happiness is independent of their experience because of their clarity of seeing things as they are. So that's the first important part of this verse. The second part is Nibbanang Paramang Vadanti Buddha. It's a reminder of the, the goal. It's a reminder of what we put up at the top. Nibbana. So why it's important and, and I think something important about it is a reminder that this isn't just a hobby. I mean you come to Buddhism, you get good things, that's great. But it's important to know to be aware that it, it goes further than simply feeling better or, or relieving stress on a basic level. Relieving stress and feeling better ultimately means um, freeing oneself from stress completely and feeling free. And so Nibbana, uh, the claim is that it's it's not only the highest, but it's also the goal. It's 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 attainable. Nibbana means release, not clinging. It means freedom from suffering. It's a it's a state when when you look and and cultivate mindfulness, you see clearly. When you see clearly, your mind lets go. Why? Because you see that the things that you cling to are not worth clinging to. They're impermanent, they're unsatisfying, they're uncontrollable. You'll see that. As the mind lets go, uh, there's less and less moments of clinging or less and less of a habit of clinging until finally the mind has a perfect clarity where it sees nothing worse worth clinging to and there's a release. That release is Nibbana, where the mind no longer interacts with samsara, it's like dropping out of it just for a moment or a few moments it can be longer but that experience is it's life changing it's, it, it's a point of reference that an ordinary person doesn't have when we talk about what is peace and what is happiness so all the things that we talk about as being this is happiness or this is peace or I practice meditation, I feel more peaceful, that's the goal. None of that is the highest. If you haven't experienced Nibbana, you haven't experienced true peace, the highest form of peace, happiness, freedom from suffering. Once you have, one who sees a Buddha even all of us who are practicing, we can become Buddhas. Anu Buddha means someone who is, becomes awakened following a Buddha. Once you see that, you know. You will say, that's the highest. All these other types of happiness and peace are inferior to true peace from letting go. Peace that comes from letting go. The third part is, again, an admonishment for monks, something you can keep in mind. It's an admonishment for everyone. I think it's quite obvious. And it may not be immediately apparent as to why the Buddha chose this 
in in his wada in his admonition. It's um, one is not a a pabajita. Pabajita means one who has left the home life. So you can't say you've truly left the home life if you hit someone, if you strike someone. Someone who is who is violent cannot be really considered a pabajita, uh, someone who has left home. A true, what do you call it, a ordained individual, I think is the point. One who has made vows to leave behind worldliness. If you're violent, you can't say you've left the world behind. But you live in a monastic community long enough, you will probably, well, I think it depends. I don't know. I've, I've lived in monastic communities where there was violence. I spent my first year as a monk, uh, not well in Canada, in a small monastic community. I think there were two or three monks. A very little violence. A little violence. A little violence, but nothing really physical. But when I went back to Thailand, I, was, I wasn't there two weeks, and I was sitting in the mess hall with the other monks, and suddenly there was a clatter, and we all turned and looked, and this one monk stood up and started pounding another monk. Blood everywhere. It happens. You, know, you put a lot of, in this case, a lot of men together. Frustration and so on. Well, what we can take from it as meditators is a reminder that coming here, saying that you've left the world, pabachita. If you bring along anger, greed, delusion, you've brought along the world. What we bring here is not uh, a part of, it's not because of this place, it's because of who we are. And just being here is not enough. Just being a monk is not really being a monk. You know, you're not a monk, you're not a recluse, you're not a meditator, let's say. You're not a yogi, you're a yoga vachara. If you're still violent, so violence, of course, comes from anger, one of the three things we try to do away with, something that keeps you from being a true reckless. And the, so the second part is the same, samana, the Buddha says, na samano hoti parang viheta yanto, if, you're, if you abuse others or harm others, you can also not be called a samana. Samana means one who has a peaceful mind, Sammana, Santimana. But it's a word that was used to describe someone who had left home. A shaman, I think it's where the word shaman comes from, originally from Sanskrit. Sh shramana. To all of us, you, all of you, you could be considered babajita, you could be considered samana because you're here doing this course, you're taking the time out of your lives, left home. But if you bring along violence, if you bring along even anger and so on, you've brought along the world, you brought the world with you. We can't keep the problems out. Just by coming here, you don't escape them, you don't leave them at home. To really and truly leave home, you have to leave that, and you have to leave all of that. You have to free yourself from all of that. Really being a recluse is more than just putting on robes. This is, this is what I was thinking when one time this monk threatened me with violence. He said he was going to throw me off a wall, I remember. Very angry at me. And then he said something, I can't, what was it about being a monk? Uh, he said, I'm a monk, you have to treat me with respect. And I said, you're not a monk. <laughs> and he came back and said, oh, I must have, I had, was accusing him of breaking some precept and that I was no longer, or that, that um, 
because he had broken that rule, he was no longer a monk, and and that was a that was an offense. By I couldn't say that without evidence. I said that's not what I meant, and I recited this verse to him. I said, "You're not a real monk because you're violent." So something. I mean, I think it's useful for us to think of the difference between coming here and saying, I am a meditator, I'm doing a meditation course, and actually truly being a meditator. It's the difference between saying, I sat for one hour, walked for one hour, walked and sat for many hours, and I was actually mindful. They're two very different things, right? You can walk and sit for many hours without any benefit if you're not mindful. So that's the second verse. The third verse, the first part is more of the same, anupavado, anupaghato, uh, teaching people to not scold. Anupavado refers to speech, so not, not scolding others, not being harsh in speech. Anupaghato is again not harming. Bhati moke jasangwaro restraint in regards to the rules of the community. So this means keeping, for us, this means keeping precepts. For monks, of course, it means keeping a lot of precepts. And a lot of those precepts are just for communal harmony. So you are all keeping more precepts than you even know. Keeping the place clean, you could say, is sort of a rule of the community. Of course, um, the rules around not eating in, in the evening. But simply having courtesy for others, not making loud noises. One of the rules, I think, is not banging a door loudly. And you're not doing that. No, I don't think that's actually a rule, but being courteous towards each other. A lot of the rules are just having communal harmony. So keeping a discipline and keeping a regimen of, of respect for each other and not sitting around chatting with each other, that sort of thing cleaning up after yourself, even cleaning, cleaning up after others, it's communal harmony. Matanyuta japatasming, moderation in eating. This is a common theme in the Buddha's teaching. Again and again he taught this sort of thing. Now you might wonder why moderation in eating is so important, but if you think about the one thing, it's really the one thing that we can't help but partake in. As far as the sources of addiction go, sources of attachment or partiality or even aversion, there's little beyond food that has such a, a strong impact on us. You know, other things like uh, entertainment, sexuality, we can give up. You, you can give them up. At least temporarily, you can come and give them up. But you can't come and give up food. And so your attachments to food become very important. It's the one thing that we do every day. And thereby cultivate partiality every day. Cultivate habits. I mean, they become so ingrained that everyone talks about what kind of food they like and dislike. How ingrained these habits become, and so how hard they come, become to to do away with. It's an important one for you to remember as meditators that when you're eating, to try and be mindful, because you'll feel the cravings in the evening when you're not supposed to be eating. You'll feel them when you're eating in the morning, likes and dislikes wishing you had other types of food, or really liking the food that you have. Just remember to be mindful, it's an important one. Pantancha sayanasanam, having a secluded dwelling. That's another important teaching. Seclusion in Buddhism has two kinds. There's seclusion of body and seclusion of mind. The best way to gain the second one is to have the first one cultivating meditation. I mean, you've done, you've come to a wonderful place. I mean, the fact that we have this place is quite magical and wonderful. It's not magical, but it's magical in a poetic sense. I mean, 
It's very rare and special that we have this place. Imagine trying to do this course living at home with your parents or with your siblings or with your partners or, or that sort of thing. The Buddha again and again reminded us to seclude ourselves, go off to the foot of a tree, go off to an empty room. We give every meditator here an empty room. We try not to put meditators together in the same room. And we're very lucky that we, you know, it's very, we've worked hard, I think, and many people have, not, it's not really me, but a lot of our volunteers have worked very hard to set this up. And I've worked very hard to remind everyone and to say, this is the way we want things. Even people would say, can we put meditators together? And no. Unless we have to, we try not to put meditators together. So here you have a room to yourself, an empty space, a secluded dwelling. Today there was loud noises outside, kids playing. So sometimes it might seem that you haven't actually come to a secluded place. This isn't the forest. You're not really alone. There are other people in the house and there are lots of other people around us. But I think there's no question that uh, seclusion can be found in a place like this. The, the noises from outside you consider to be like the sound of birds. The other people in the house, it's the rustling of the wind and the creaking of the trees. If you ever lived in the jungle, it's actually not that quiet. There's a lot of noise in there as well. But what you mostly have, and the greatest, the most important part of physical seclusion, is you don't have anyone bothering you. There's no one saying, hey, I want to go watch a movie or play a game or uh, manipulating you or criticizing you, putting obligations on you, this sort of thing. You have no work to go to, you have no family responsibilities. You've abdicated all your responsibilities. You've given them up in favor of something more important, something that you've found to be more pressing at this time. And so you should feel that seclusion very strongly, that you have none of those pressing engagements or interactions with other people. And the last part of the verses is Adijiteja Ayogo. Ayoga. Again with the word yoga. It's literally the same as saying yoga. Ayoga. I'm not sure what the a adds, but it means literally the same thing. It means exertion, dedication. Yoga is again being bound to something. It may very well be what the word religion means. Religion means potentially means being bound to something. When you you commit yourself to something, being committed, being dedicated. So what do we dedicate? What did the Buddha say dedicate yourself to? As the last part of the verse, Etang Buddhana Sasana. This is the teaching of all Buddhas. What did all Buddhas tell us to be dedicated to? Not the Buddha. Not a statue, or uh, not angels, not even your teacher. Be dedicated to adi citta. Citta means mind, adi means higher, it means high. Adi means exalted or uh, something put, put up, higher. And it's a good way of describing really anything that comes from meditation. Well, describing the distinction between states of mind. Because you could argue some things that might call themselves meditation actually don't lead to any higher mind. It's a distinction between states. 
and you could say a distinction between types of meditation, that the only worthwhile meditations are those that lead to higher minds or high minds. What are the high states of mind? They're things like clarity, focus, uh, tranquility, equanimity, wisdom, mindfulness. Even things like love, compassion, these are higher minds. So dedication to all of these, even if you sit and wish all beings to be happy, it's a good thing to do for meditators, if I haven't mentioned it. Take some time out of your day to reflect on all the people you know and wish for them all to be happy. It's a good, good support for your meditation, for your mindfulness practice. But the idea is to cultivate minds that are higher, minds that are beyond ordinary. This isn't just meditation to feel peaceful or calm. It's about cultivation and mental development, bhavana they call it. Developing more peaceful, more clear, more knowledge, more, more wisdom, more wise states of mind. Adhichitta, that's what we are to be devoted to. And when you practice mindfulness, when you're uh, trying to see, to grasp the objects as they are, this is what comes up. It's like squeezing out all the impurities, filtering them all out. I mean, what it literally is, is coming to be more objective about reality. Teaching yourself a way to see things, reminding yourself of the way things are, rather than getting caught up in what you think of them how you feel about them, the liking, the disliking, the identification as me and mine and that sort of thing. That's the teaching of all the Buddhas. So this is, in, in all, it's called the Avada Patimoka. And it's what the Buddha would teach. So there you have your Avada. It all boils down to the first part. It all boils down to being mindful. The awada that the Buddha would give is to remind about rules and remind about practical things. But all of that is simply a basis and a support for the practice of mindfulness, which all of you are doing very well at. So. Much appreciation for your work, and I'm here to support you. That's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for listening.